uh, next speaker is uh, Kumar Mbatha. Um, he's going to talk on finiteness, compactness. He said, there's a, maybe a swamp. Yes. yes, thank you uh, to the organizers of this fantastic conference and these difficult times. Uh, I'm also grateful for their inviting me to give a talk here. I'm going to talk about uh, certain themes which are loosely related, and in particular, finiteness and compactness that has been seen in the string theory landscape and the relation to Swampland. So this is going to be based on a number of works uh, with uh, very good collaborators I've been lucky to work with, uh, including Yuta Hamada, Uri Tarazi, uh, and Miguel Montero, Irene Valenzuela, Cody Long, and Alec Pedroia. Uh, some of them already appeared and some of them are work in progress. So uh, let me first uh, say, give you a review for my talk. Uh, the plan is, first of all, I talk about finiteness of the string landscape, what evidence we have that the string landscape is finite. And then I focus about the perspective that we get from the swampland conditions, what kind of reasons do we have for finiteness and theories with 16 supercharges, and, uh, and talk about compactness of the brain probes and the relation of that to reconstructing of the internal geometry of the, uh, of the space, as we see in string theory, from the low energy effective field theory perspective. Uh, Finiteness in 60 is the next thing I will mention briefly, and then I move on to the so-called the desert scenario and the relation of the desert scenario with finiteness. So we, it has been a long conjectured or believed that there are a finite number of known Minkowski, well, there are a finite number of known Minkowski vacuum, but they're also believed that there are a finite number period because uh, in particular, an example of it being the context of Calabia, for example, it's believed that the number of Calabia manifolds of a given dimension are believed to be finite. Uh, we don't have a proof of this, but it's uh, conjecture. Uh, of course, this should not be confused with, the, with what we see in the context of ADS-CFT. Uh, we, of course, have infinitely many defects in a given theory. For example, in type 2b, you can have three brains, an arbitrary number of them you can put parallel to each other and go to the low energy limit of that and get the, the so-called the, the description of ADS-CFT in terms of the relation to these D3 brains. There are infinitely many ends you can choose in 4D of course in 10D. That's not, so the infinity has nothing to do with that. The finiteness refers here to the theory in the bulk. And uh, this is also related to the fact that if you want to have ADS, you will always have, end up with these extra degrees of freedom, which is uh, this uh, fact that there's a six extra dimensions in the context of D3 brain. This is related to the, the Sutter conjecture, ADS conjecture that uh, Irene mentioned and the tower of light states. So let me focus uh, mainly here on the finite number, finiteness in the context of the Minkowski vacuum. And the examples we know on string theory, there are plenty, but uh, let's just review some simple ones with higher number of supersymmetry. A theory with 16 supercharges in D dimensions in the string landscape uh, has a bound, at least in all the known examples we know how to construct, for the group that appears, which basically defines the theory, the rank of the group is less than or equal to 26 minus T. And a theory with eight supercharges in 60 has, uh, uh, in fact, a provably finite construction from F theory, because there's actually now a proof that there are a finite number of elliptic Calabia threefolds. And so therefore, if you use any of them, you only get a finite number of choices. So these examples and many more suggest that for any consistent theory of quantum gravity in any dimension, there is an upper bound on the number of massless modes, which may depend on the dimension and the number of supersymmetries. So this, uh, this suggests a lucky situation, a lucky feature for us, that the landscape of consistent quantum gravity theories is finite. So this is what I refer to as a finiteness conjecture. So let's start with what we can say from the bottom up, from the effective field theory perspective now. Well, if you, if you start with the highest amount of supersymmetry with 32 supercharges, the massless modes are determined by supersymmetry alone and is unique. So at least uh, the matter content is fixed. And in this case, uh, uh, there's this finite, it's just one, one unique choice. So that's a trivially satisfied at the level of at least of massless field. Of course, one could imagine a theory where you have the same massless field and but infinitely many 
different uh, UV completions of it, but I'm not going to be discussing that. I'm going to focus only on the massless mode. Here is with 16 supercharges. The chiral versions of 60 and 10 D are essentially fixed by anomalies. Uh, 16 supercharges have different versions with or without uh, chirality. In 60 and 10 D, for example, we get chiral versions, and those are fixed by anomalies and they're finite. Therefore, <clears throat> they, one can check explicitly they are finite. There are not many choices. For non-chiral versions, uh, using a stronger version of the completeness hypothesis, uh, in this context applied to strings, uh, to the fact that there's a, there's a two-form gauge field, and using the strong form of the distance conjecture, uh, it has been argued that the rank of the group should be less than or equal to 26 minus T, which is what we have seen in the string landscape. I briefly talked about this in my uh, string talk last year. Uh, in particular, uh, I focused on dimensions, uh, high dimensions uh, with 16 charges, 16 supersymmetries, dimensions seven, eight, and nine. So the upper bound of 26 minus T is what, uh, what is, uh, what is denoted here by these red, uh, red lines here, 17, 18, and 19 are the upper bounds that you get in string landscape. But actually the ones that you do see in, in string landscape are given by the ranks denoted here by the green squares. Not every rank that is less than those numbers up here. The yellow ones are the ones, the yellow and the green ones are the ones which are consistent with anomalies, some discrete anomalies. And, uh, Still, you see that you don't get all of those. You only get very specific subset of, given by these green ones. And the rank restriction in dimension nine and eight uh, uh, has been uh, described, has been related to coordinate conjecture. And this one I talked about last year. And as I mentioned there in the dimension seven, the fact that you get the parity correct, these green ones is explained, but not all of why don't you get these other ranks. So we have some, some uh, amount of success in describing what we actually see in the string landscape from swamp and ideas. But uh, in fact, there are more to be said here because not all combinations of gauge groups with the correct rank appear. It's not enough to say, well, we have a theory with rank 17, just choose any gauge group you want, which adds up to that rank. Not all of them appear. So at least they don't appear in string landscape. Is that the reason for them or there are other constructions that we're missing? <clears throat> Can we explain this? So the swampland bounds up to now had focused mainly on unitarity of string probes. And the basic uh, new ingredient that we want to consider is the magnetic version of these strings. So for example, in eight dimensions, the magnetic version of a string is a three brain. Gauge group instantons, if you have an instant gauge, gauge symmetry in eight dimensions, instantons lead to a three brain charge due to their coupling. So you can view these three brains as related to the instantons. <clears throat> and these preserve half of the supersymmetry, leading to a theory in 4D, and namely on the three brain probe, which has n equal to two supersymmetry in four dimensions. So, uh, so when you, so you have zero size instanton or these brain probes, what we usually think about, but now we can think about it in terms of the effective 8D theory without re reference to where we got this 8D theory from. Now we get a rank one Coulomb branch from studying these small instantons. And this gives you a Coulomb branch for these 4D n equal to two theories. And now we want to study what kind of Coulomb branches we get. And now I argue that this Coulomb branch should be compact based on black hole entropy arguments. So the black hole entropy arguments uh, compactify, give you a reason why these Coulomb branch should be compact. So in fact, more generally, we argue that in a D-dimensional quantum theory of gravity, the moduli space of any P brain with P less than D minus two is compact. More precisely, the spectrum of the Laplacian on it is discrete. So the basic idea is to compactify the theory and from D dimension on it, let's say P dimensional torus and wrap a P brain on it, leading to a black hole in D minus P dimension by this. The eigenstates of Laplacian translate to states of black hole. Now we have the analog of a zero brain in this lower dimensional theory. The number of states in a given mass range is, is given by the bekenstein hawken formula. Uh, so you can compute how many states you're going to get. And eigenstates of Laplacian in a given range do correspond to a subset of these. And so it cannot be infinite. It cannot be more than the bekenstein hawken bound. 
So therefore, we should get a, a limited number. And in particular, we cannot have a non-compact space. Otherwise, we get an infinite number of low energy modes like that. And that's impossible. So the moduli space of any brain in the quantum gravity is finite as long as the dimension assumption is small. <clears throat> so let me make a side remark. Uh, so if we could apply this argument to space-time filling brains, uh, having compact moduli, this in effect would mean that the bulk scalar fields themselves, because you can view the bulk scalar fields as if they are scalars associated to some space-time filling brain, they should be morally compact. Indeed, this is the spirit of the distance conjecture that any effective field theory has only a finite range of validity. And the larger distance you go, you get light states emerging exponentially like power emerging. And this fits with the idea of emergence of infinite distance and field space, as mentioned, uh, as suggested by these authors, from finite compact spaces. In other words, the reason we are getting infinite distance is because we have infinite power of light modes and that's the only way this non-compactness can be evaded. Compactness can be evaded by these infinite power. And in fact, one can compute one corrections to the field metric uh, from this tower plus some mild assumptions to show that the, the mass of the tower decreases exponentially with distance and field space as demanded by the distance conjecture. So uh, let me go back now to the 8D case for 16 supercharges. As I was mentioning, the, we are focusing on three brain probes, which sure can be viewed as a Coulomb branch associated with the small instantons. Now, um, so this gives you a one dimensional compact space, a one dimensional space which should be compact, but if you consider coupling constant represented by a nitty curve on the, over this moduli space, it's easy to use n equal to supersymmetry to show that this gives rise to a hyperkähler geometry. So, so you do automatically get out of this a four-dimensional hyperkähler space. And so therefore, since it should be compact, we end up only with two possibilities. Either it's a four-dimensional torus or K3. Now, it has to be K3 if we have any non-trivial gauge group. And that has that you can see that because you can study locally the structure of this Coulomb branch with, when you have any non trivial gauge group. And therefore, we deduce that the marginalized space of three brain better be K3. One can also envision a possibility of having disjoint unions of K3s, but this could be ruled out by a strong form of cohortis conjecture. So, so this is uh, indeed consistent with what we know with the NF theory realization of these theories. In this context, the three brain is nothing but the D3 brain probing the internal F theory compactification on elliptic K3. So we have thus reconstructed the internal string geometry from the perspective of IR effective theory. This is quite amusing because one would have thought that IR may not have information about the extra space and we are not going to KK modes to discover what this is. But just the very fact that we know something about extra dimensional brains, uh, properties of higher dimensional brains, in this case, a three brain, leads us together with supersymmetry and compactness to a restricted possibility, in this case, K3. So somehow it is surprising that low energy has access somehow to K3, which is what we know from string theory constructions. Of course, whether or not the KK modes of that K3 have anything to do with massive modes that can be seen in eight dimensions is a different story or at the very least we are beginning to see that we can kind of, uh, instead of the famous question, can you, uh, uh, hear the, can you hear the shape of the drum, which is by the eigenvalues of Laplacian or the KK modes, can you reconstruct the geometry? Here we see that by the brain probe, by studying the brain probes, we can possibly get an internal insight to the internal string compactifications. With a higher amount of supersymmetry, we can argue in stuff K3, we get tori, and that's also consistent with what we know in string compactification. For maximal rank theories with 16 supercharges uh, for D bigger than six, this argument reconstructs the observed gauge symmetries in the string landscape. So at least for the maximal rank, namely 26 minus D, we are done with getting all the gauge symmetries that string landscape sees. And this provides another strong evidence for the string lamppost principle that all the consistent quantum gravities are uh, constructed in string landscape. For the lower rank theories, this study provides additional restrictions on gauge groups that appear, but does not completely fix the allowed sets to the known example. So it would be good to find other ways to think about it to, 
to completely uh, fix the gauge groups that we actually do observe in string landscape. For theories with lower supersymmetry, let me just say something about theories with eight supercharges, like 4D and equal to two, but let's start with the, well, let's just only talk about the simplest one of those, which is the first dimension, this uh, number of supersymmetry appears. This is in six dimensions with one comma zero supersymmetry. In these cases, anomaly considerations greatly reduce the available possibilities for matter, but still allow for unbounded number of masses modes. It can be argued, uh, it can be argued that at least all such cases belong to the swamp band uh, by a careful study of unitarity properties of the BK strings in such theories. Some work we recently finished with my student Huri. So again, it seems that we have a landscape with an upper bound on the number of masses modes. So this is uh, further evidences for all these finiteness I was referring to. But why are we getting? What is the reason for this finiteness? What is the explanation of it? Um, and uh, this will be related to what I would call the desert scenario. So one idea of trying for trying to explain the finiteness conjecture is based on the species problem for black holes. The species problem is the following. If you take, if you suppose you have a number n of light modes, and suppose n is arbitrarily large, and if you consider the entropy of a fixed size, say black Planck size or slightly bigger than the Planck size black hole, if you fix it, then the Bekenstein Hawking entropy cannot account for all of these ends if n is arbitrarily large. So this is the species problem for the black hole. So one might use this to try to bound the end, for example, to try to argue for this finiteness. However, a proposal to avoid the species problem and get arbitrarily large n is based on noting that any effective theory has a cutoff that may depend on n. Um, so in a quantum theory of gravity, we expect the cutoff scale uh, to be, uh, for the effective theory to be always, of course, less than the Planck scale, so we expect there to be a cutoff lambda less than one in Planck units. So the radius of all black holes that you can describe using this effective theory will have to satisfy that R is bigger than one over lambda, depending on what lambda is. Now, as long as the entropy, uh, which goes like the, the area of the black hole R to D minus two, goes like, uh, which goes like uh, the smallest you can have, which is lambda to minus D plus two, as long as this is bigger than n, you have avoided the problem of the species problem. In other words, if, if the cutoff is less than n to the minus one over d minus two, this avoids the species problem, as was noted in this paper. Uh, so this lambda, the lambda being equal to n to the minus one over d minus two is called the uh, species scale. So it seems like uh, we cannot use the finiteness of n uh, to try to finiteness of uh, to try to have this black hole issue to try to argue for finiteness of the black hole and finiteness of the string vacuum. So at first sight, it appears that we do not have an argument for boundedness of n and finiteness of the landscape. However, if we can argue that lambda should be close to Planck scale for some other reason that it cannot be too far from it, then we may have an argument. If we have some kind of independent argument that lambda cannot be too small compared to the Planck scale, then we have an argument. But actually lambda, uh, the cutoff will depend on, for, for example, for supersymmetric theories where you have massless moduli, the lambda will depend on what web you choose for these uh, massless moduli. So the question is whether or not uh, you can, as you change this moduli, can you go to points where this lambda is very close to the Planck scale. Can you always find points on the moduli space of theories for which there is a lambda is close to Planck scale? In other words, do we always have a desert? Can we always go to a point in the moduli space which realizes the so-called the desert scenario? This desert scenario has been, of course, noted in the context of standard, uh, in the context of uh, grand unifications and the standard model where we talk about the, what is what lies between the energy scale we see in the standard model all the way up to grand unification scales and the Planck scale. So here we have, you know, in the log of the mass scale I'm drawing in Planck units, 
uh, we have minus three is the gut scale and minus 19 or something like that around that scale is the weak scale. And uh, so this is more or less massless here. And the question is, are there any other states here? In other words, our description here, does it have a cutoff or can we push the cutoff all the way up to some dot scale or what? So this is the so-called desert scenario or the question of desert scenario. And the question in our context is whether or not you can realize this for any quantum theory of gravity where you can push all the not light states all the way up to very close to Planck scale, maybe order minus one, minus two, minus three near the Planck scale. Can you, in other words, so you have all these tower of states which are massive and can you always find the point on the moduli where the lightest ones that appear are close to the Planck scale? If this is the Planck scale. So how do we address this question? Well, this seems to be the case for all the theories realizing the string landscape with at least 16 supercharges. For example, heterotic string at self dual moduli and string coupling over the one as this feature, you can push every, every state. In fact, more precisely, what we can of course measure or reliably compute in these cases will be BPS states. We can check the mass of all the BPS states or scales associated with them, all go to very close to the Planck scale. That's the one example that we can actually push them all the way up. How about lower supersymmetry cases? It's a feature of too much higher supersymmetry. Let's go to the next case we can try to study with eight supercharges. So in 60, uh, 1,0 theories, which is the first case we get eight supercharges, we can study the following question. Uh, again, I want to focus on BPS uh, objects because that we can reliably compute the associated mass scale. Of course, it doesn't mean there are no other states which have other masses, but this is the only thing we can completely reliably compute and presumably everything else decays to these guys in some form. So let me focus on BPS objects. In 61,0 theories, you have a whole variety of BPS strings. For example, in F theory, you have, uh, you have three brains which wrap around two cycles on the F theory base, and these give you string, and depending on which two cycle of the F theory base you choose. So what we did is that we examined 34,000 uh, or 871 toric bases in the context of F theory compactification and tried to go to the moduli on this FDA by going to the sizes of these spheres and so on, such that you can push the strings of the mass scale associated with these strings as much as possible close to the time to see how much you get it. Of course, sometimes you can shrink them. That's not what you want to do. You want to kind of make them all big, all these two cycles big so that the tension of these strings are large. So you're as much as possible close to the Planck scale. The question is, did we succeed or not? So here I will, I will show you the result of that experiment. So here, H11 is the number of these uh, two cycles or what's in the 60 language is gonna be the number of tensor multiplets in the log scale. So here they go all the way up to around 100 or so. And then the up scale is the, is the lambda, the, cut, the, the cutoff that we get when we tune the corresponding moduli to get these tension as close as possible to the Planck scale. So we see that we, we more or less succeed to get it. However, there's some behavior that as we go into larger number of tensors, which is larger number of like degrees of freedom, larger n. So you can think of this like the analog of the n. You see that the actual, uh, the lambda goes down. So in fact, you get a bigger gap. The biggest gap we got here was, uh, the farthest we got to the Planck scale here because it was around minus 1.5. So not much by, by, by just one order of magnitude, slightly more than one order of magnitude only away from Planck scale. And if you look at the species bound in this case, you find in the 5D, it goes like n to the minus quarter. And so it has a lower slope. So this is, of course, we don't have an a priori explanation of why this slope should be minus 0.7, but this already tells you that this cannot, this slope cannot kind of continue and it has to stop because then it will be lower than the species scale, which cannot be. In other words, this bound better be higher than the species bound. Otherwise there'll be contradiction with the black hole physics. And so that would say that H11, the tens number of tensors should stop somewhere. And so that is at least a kind of a semi-qualitative explanation if we could understand this mild behavior of this cutoff with the scale. So this does not quite completely do the job for explaining finiteness, but it goes towards the idea that the, the issue of the black hole species problem might be related 
to this finiteness in some refined version. So I think I've run out of my time, so let me conclude. We have seen various examples which reinforce the picture that the landscape of consistent quantum gravities are finite. A refined version of desert scenario may imply bounds on the number of masses mode as expected from finiteness. Compactness of the brain probe leads to reconstruction of internal geometry in some cases. It'd be nice to try to, try to extend this to more cases and try to actually see whether or not we can actually explain why string landscape is related to consistency of uh, quantum gravity from the infrared viewpoint using these ideas. And uh, this provides further evidence for the string, string lampposts, at least in the examples with higher supersymmetry, as well as lending further support for the emergence proposal of the distance conjecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, um, are there questions? Uh, Miguel Montero. Miguel? Uh, sorry, I know I didn't have a question. I was just clapping. Oh, sorry. Uh, Walken Taylor? Yeah, thanks, Cameron, for the nice talk. Thank Very you. interesting stuff. I just had a quick question. In the last thing you were talking about, you said that you looked at 38,000 toric bases. So, you know, when Dave and I classified the toric bases for 60F theory, we found 61,000. I'm just curious what your criterion was, yes. like which subset you looked at, and whether you think there's something wrong with the other part. No, there's nothing wrong with the other cases. I mean, originally I had the whole base uh, as part of it. The thing is that they had these uh, blow up modes you had to further do to get rid of these two cycles. So we didn't want to get to the complicated ones. So we had the simpler ones. But Very good. So you just didn't study. worry about the ones with that extra yes, property. Yes, yes. Cool. Thanks a lot. Very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Eva? Eva, you had a question? Yes, I did. I didn't know I raised my hand. Um, talk. It's interesting to see these finiteness properties in the supersymmetric cases. Um, but most compactifications are not um, supersymmetric, and most manifolds are not Glabiao. Most are negatively curved. And there we know that are infinite sequences of manifolds. And these, these manifolds are understood very, very well. Well, there's nothing mysterious about them, Matthew. Um, so, so in order to you know, establish some sort of finiteness conjecture, you would, you would have to rule out compactifications on any hyperbolic space. Yeah, so, so this, of course, For example, the question, what um, happens? Oh, sorry, I, didn't, I thought the thing was finished. So yeah, indeed, Eva, as you said, we, we certainly do not have any claims about the general statement, which is much more, much more difficult. Even the supersymmetric case is very hard to deal with. So, uh, and then the other ones, the non-supersymmetric cases, we have to deal with stabilization issues, which even with n equals to one supersymmetry is hard because of scope potential. So, here, I was just focusing on the cases we, we have much easier time. Uh, clearly, we, even in this set, we should, we should have no reason to have had finite. At least we should explain why if there's finite. And I want to focus on the case where we actually have strong evidence that's finite before we move on to cases which are harder to study. But yes, of course, we have to study more cases down the line. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Okay, thanks. I mean, one thing I would add is just that it's not it's not always the case that the Susie case is actually easier to study because it legislates against certain contributions that can help. And in public geometry, for example, we know the metric, whereas in Calabiaos, we typically know the metric. We know the K3 metric now, thanks to Shamit and uh, his collaborators. Um, but say for hypersymmetric Calabiaos, we don't. So they're, in that sense, they're actually harder. Yeah, the stability issue is the main thing that I think is, is the driving the discussion we have. Of course, if we had ways to understand stabilities, then that would be a different story. Okay, I think we can stop here. Uh, thank you again, Kumru. Thank you. And we have a, there is a break now, right? I don't know if you want to say.